Okay, so, thank you. I'm Hazel. Um, I'm Hazel Watson. I'm the Head of Mental Health and Learning Disabilities in the Nursing Directorate um, at NHS England. Um, so I have a number of responsibilities, as, as colleagues were saying earlier, in terms of clinical practice. Um, I am particularly interested in this agenda and how we... I'm a nurse, I'm a registered nurse, and actually some of the things that we do um, in the name of nursing and good practice are some of the things that actually we need to change, um, and we need to change quickly. So, this will be no surprise, this is where we all started from. Um, this was the MIND report um, that came out in June 2013. Um, I'm not going to go through what it says, I'm sure everybody in the room has read the report, but what it told us was about the disparity of practice, about the variety um, that was going on in, in, the, in the country. Bearing in mind that um, the freedom of information request that MIND made, they only made to NHS trusts. So this information is only based on the information they got back from NHS trusts and not from the independent sector. Um, which actually speaks volumes in itself because a lot of our provision is in the independent sector and particularly in the secure part of the independent sector. But I have to say, I remember at that point, I was the director of nursing in a, in, in a trust down in the southwest, getting the freedom of information request. Didn't really give it too much thought. Gave the data back. Thought, well, actually, that, that's what we do. And was kind of horrified for my own practice and for my own trust about what we knew and what we didn't know and how much attention we'd paid and how much attention we hadn't paid. So whether all the statistics that are in this report are right or wrong wasn't kind of really the point. What it showed us was massive amounts of disparity and actually probably not enough attention being paid at that time. And if we needed to know it, here came the CQC report, which was published earlier this year, which said exactly the same. Um, again, talked about um, creeping increases in coercive practice, um, large variation in restrictive practice, and of course the CQC do get to look um, both at NHS trusts and, and in the independent sector, and also thinking about the social care sector and the impact of practice there as well. But what they also said, again, is, is what we all know, that actually there is evidence for scope for reduction. We can do better. It's not, we're not practicing optimally. So this variation in practice um, and the evidence that we have where places actually are doing much better shows us that actually there is scope. There is scope for improvement and we ought to grab that scope um, and, and work with it. I'm not going to go through this. We've heard beautifully exposed this morning um, one of the um, examples. We do have lots of existing good practice and there are services and there are organisations that work really hard at this and who do this really well. And what we want is for every organisation and every service and every experience to be doing, to be doing the same and working, and working hard. I've just put up four examples here. There are others. So, myself and a number of other colleagues, and actually I think, Iris, you were part of the conversation, weren't you, when Norman Lamb invited a number of us to come and talk about actually what is happening, what are people's experiences, what can we do, and quickly came to a position where this needs government-level support and government-level attention because we want the system to change and we want it to change systemically and we want it to change permanently. Alongside that, we're going to give our careful attention to policy and regulation and make sure that all of that works to be able to support the system to make the changes. We've already heard really eloquently this morning about the importance of service user, family and advocate involvement. We, not only can we as a system not do this without knowing and understanding what that is, actually we have no right to do it either without involving people and their families and the people that work with them. This is their experience, not our experience. Um, so we need to put a lot of, pay a lot of attention to that element. Again, we heard this morning as part of the six core strategies the, the imperative importance of effective leadership in this area. So there are some levers in the system that we're starting to see that support leadership, that start to talk to organisations, to boards, to executives, to be clear to them about their responsibilities. 
Training and education, clearly we need to make sure that people have the, tr the training and the tools and the, and the techniques available to them. Um, we spent quite a long time nationally thinking about whether we should um, be clearer in terms of training standards and actually whether we should regulate training standards um, in this area. That's not, that's not a path we chose to go down, um, but I'm acutely aware it leaves us therefore with some decisions to make in service. Which, which training package do we, do we, do we use? How, how, do we, how do we train? What tools and techniques do we offer people? Um, and we don't yet really have a consistent understanding um, of, of what that needs to look like. New ways of working, obviously we cannot continue to do things in the way that we were. And again, we've heard this morning of the real importance of using data. Actually, if we don't know what we're doing, then we don't know what needs changing and how to make things better. And similarly, and of course this is obviously very clearly coordinated presentation, um, we've heard about effective review procedures and debriefing. So out of all of that thinking came this, and again I'm not going to go through this, this is a document that everybody in this room will be very, very well aware of. What it does is set out principles to be applied consistently in all areas of health and care. And what it does really clearly is give some must-dos for providers, practitioners, commissioners, workforce and regulation, so that every part of the system should be pointing in the same direction and that the levers that we've got available to us as a system are pulling to help us improve the practice that we've got. So these are some examples of, of where you will see positive and proactive care replicated and the thinking and the principles repeating themselves um, so that we are providing a consistent approach. Colleagues in the room will know about the Mental Health Code of Practice um, that was issued in April last year, April this year. Um, there's a whole chapter now um, on practice and how to work and how to work in a safe way. You'll see the same words in the Mental Health Crisis Care Concordat standards, in the NHS England and Local Government uh, Association Core Principles Commissioning Tool for people with a learning disability. More recently, the National Service Model that NHS England have just published again talks about positive and proactive care, talks about the fact that we expect services um, to, to be practicing with these standards and, and, in, and in these sorts of ways. You'll see it replicated in all of the Health Education England, Skills for Health, Skills for Care, documentation and all of the supporting work that came out of the positive and proactive work um, and nice guidance all of the nice guidance that's been produced that supports our practice in this area for the last couple of years all refers to this way of working so in terms of helping us get policy into system delivery the guidance that we put out um, across across sectors has to be consistent and clear and all in lines with the principle that we're working with and we also need to make sure that as well as guidance, because we've had stacks of guidance, haven't we, um, that actually we've got some levers in the system that help us support people to put that guidance into practice. Um, so you will now, again, you will now see these standards in the NHS standard contract that we work with, the local authority social care contracts refer to it, the uh, CCGs, the clinical commissioning groups assurance mechanisms talk about that, so CCGs, when you're looking at the services that you're purchasing, look at them through the lens of positive and proactive care. Is the, is the service that you're buying meeting these standards? I'm sure many people in the room will have been on the back end of or part of um, Care Quality Commission um, reviews of services. Again, the positive and proactive care standards are a key part of their key lines of inquiry. Um, for healthcare and social care and starting to think about primary care and the impact of how primary care works in the same way. And some of you in the room may have seen yesterday the government's response to the No Voice Unheard, No Right Ignored um, green paper um, says some things. Um, one of the things it refers to is positive and proactive care and actually that we need to make sure that people are working with, treating people, respecting people in the way that we would all want. So we have the guidance and it's consistent guidance and we have levers in the system and we're using all of the levers in the system across all of the agencies to support this guidance to be, to, to, to be delivered. However, so what about practice? Because actually this is about better practice. 
But it feels as if we're getting to the point, if we're not there already um, nationally, where this is not about whether we do it, but how we do it. And actually, we have, a, we have an acceptance, not before time, that actually we have some work to do here. And if we're not already on the journey of doing it, then we need to get, um, we, we need to start moving on it fairly quickly. And of course, for services, it, it, it spreads quite rightly. This is not just about restraint and coercive practice. You also need to think about the other policies and the other ways of working, either in your service or, or, with, or, or with your service users. I mean, the obvious ones, you know, observation policy, searching policy, all of, those, all of those things are trigger points, all of those things are examples and um, incidences of how our service users and how people who work with us will experience the care and support that we offer. Um, so as we think about one way of working with people, we need to make sure that actually it's consistent across all of our ways of working with people. And again, what we know is, and what we'll hear a lot about both today and tomorrow, um, you know, the most effective strategies are those that actually stop us getting into that position in the first place. And that actually working with people and knowing people and understanding people and ensuring that our services are therapeutic services and welcoming and working with people and offering people choice and are based on the recovery model and are working in a rights-based way, these are the things that actually impact on the quality of care and the quality of service that we provide. Um, you know, we, there are situations, and Iris has referred to, where actually some hands-on intervention may be necessary. But actually we have to work really hard to make sure that those are exceptions and that actually our, our environments and our working behaviour is as good as it can be. So just as I was thinking about this, these are the sorts of conversations that we've been having, aren't they, for the last, for the last couple of years. Um, this only applies to mental health settings. No, it doesn't. This applies to every setting. This applies to all health and social care settings commissioned or delivered by the NHS or local authorities. Interestingly, including care in individuals' homes. And that's right. Um, and on a personal basis, I think, well, actually, how are we monitoring that then? And have we got some thinking to do as we um, promote, because we would want to, direct payments, personal budgets, people's individual um, lives and ways of working? How confident are we about the quality of what's happening and about people's safety and the safeguards that we can put into that system? I think we've got some thinking to do about that yet. But this applies to all settings. And we hear that the acuity on wards is going up. Well, yes. Yes, it is. Um, and we still have to work with people in the most um, rights-based, recovery-focused way that we can. We can't manage without using prone restraint. Really? Um, then I suggest you talk to colleagues in Mersey Care and other organisations that have worked really hard to think about how they can do things differently. Um, and, but we need to learn from each other in terms of, in terms of how, we, how we ensure that best practice is, 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 is delivered. It doesn't, appear to, it doesn't uh, apply to high-secure hospitals. Yes, it does. Um, so our high-secure hospital colleagues are working hard and working together, and uh, we work a lot between NHS England and the department around practice and how to support them to, to work particularly in, in, in practice. Um, somebody, some, somebody talked about special, special patients, um, and there may... I haven't worked in high-secure services. And I'm sure there are occasions when um, some techniques are, are, are necessary and required, um, but actually, f physically, people are the same. Um, so we just need to think really carefully about why that is and in what context, in, in, and in what context that is. We need to use restraint to protect staff. Well, actually, we've heard eloquently this morning, and we'll hear again, that actually, if you get your restraint reduction right, actually, it's a better working environment for people, and it's a less... Um, it's a less violent working environment for people and therefore we protect staff better by reducing the numbers of restraint incidences that we use. And if we report every incident, we'll never get any real work done. Um, I have some empathy with this. I'm a practising nurse. Um, but if we don't, and we don't understand our data, and we don't understand what's going on in services, we have no basis 
on which to make the improvements. We have no basis on which to measure the improvements that we want to make. And we need to be um, as open and transparent and as learning as we possibly can in this area. So we have to. We have to measure and monitor what we're doing. But I think the real reason that actually this policy um, is important and will and I genuinely think will 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 stick. Our changes in the way that we work will stick. And the reason is this is not a policy, is it? This is not this is not clustering. This is not a clustering policy. It's not an infection control policy. This is at the fundamental core of what we do as practitioners and the service that we provide. This is this is core nursing, it's core working, and actually we, as every practitioner, should want to get this right. We shouldn't, we need guidance, we need the levers, we need all of those things, but actually this will work because we want it to work. And this is a quote from the report, I believe it might even have been yours, Iris. Um, and I, th I think actually not, not in my name. This is not, this is not nursing, this is not the services that we should be providing. And we need to think really hard about how we can do things better. And I think that's all. Thank you.